Welcome to Truth in Movies. I'm Jay Dreamers. Great Scott. There's a lot happening in this movie. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. I feel like it needs no introduction. I feel like you should have seen it by now. Basically, there's no there's no uh, warnings or anything. So this is Truth in Movies. I'm going to break down Back to the Future. I hope you have a drink. I hope you have something because there's a lot. There's a lot. So without any further ado, hello to everyone in, this, in the chat. Thanks for supporting my channel. Thanks for being here and for being awesome people in the Good Vibe Tribe. Let's jump into Back to the Future. First, I just want to say real quick the title, Back to the Future. Um, we have to to get to the future, we have to go backwards. We have to, we have to, uh, basically look back at our hit at our history and refigure out some things. So a lot of that's going to be touched on in the movie. Let's jump into it. it says back to the future. It could also be back to the future as in like your, your back is facing away from the future. Like they, uh, they don't want to take a look at prophecy or what's going to happen in the future, <laughs> kind of like uh, Bruno. All right, so we start things off. We're in Doc's garage right now. You might think it's his house, but I'll tell you what happened to his house. This is Doc's garage filled with all of these clocks. It says it's starring Michael J. Fox. These clocks are interesting. I'm going to point out a lot of the props in this movie because everything in here is context for a, a secret message that they're sending to the audience for those who know. Christopher Lloyd's in the movie. Christopher Lloyd is going to come up a lot, not just because he's Doc and he's one of the main characters, but because of his roles that he plays in so many other movies where he's uh, associated with lightning or some sort of redeemer type figure or, um, or basically the plasma apocalypse personified. All right, so the time is 7.53 a.m. Christopher Lloyd stars in the, mo in the movie. What does that mean anyway, right? Lloyd, Christopher Lloyd. I've heard Lloyd come up a few times. It means gray-haired or sacred. So Doc is basically Gandalf, essentially. He's Gandalf, he's Doc the Gray. So Christopher Lloyd means gray-haired. Really interesting. It says Lloyd is a boy's name. It's pronounced uh, Lloyd. It is of Welsh origin, and it means gray-haired or sacred. So Christopher Lloyd tends to play these parts that are sacred, that are special, that are magical, that are out of the ordinary. It also says uh, literally means gray from the Proto-Indo-European root pel, pel, which means pale or can be conveyed as pale. Pale as in a pale light, um, like a shining light. The gray really refers to how, like, the brightness of something. Uh, Pell also is, is one of the roots that you'll get for uh, pole, which is going to come up a lot because we talk about the rod god and the pole god that people worship uh, worldwide. Now, one of the clocks actually gives you some foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the future. It looks like it's Doc, if you've seen the movie already, holding on to the clock tower, but it's not the right time. That's interesting. Well, this is actually a reference to another movie, a silent film that's um, so old that it's in the public domain now. And it's called Safety Last with another character dangling from the, the hands of a Roman numeral type clock. And uh, it's not Christopher Lloyd, but the actor's name ends with Lloyd. Interestingly enough, the gray Lloyd character hanging from the clock. Uh, so this guy's name is Harold Lloyd. And it says, uh, oh, his, his full name, check this out, Harold Clayton Lloyd. Isn't that something? I mean, if you've seen part two and part three, then you know already that there was a ravine in part three named after Clara Clayton, uh, the romantic figure for Doc Brown. Interesting stuff. All right, so we're panning through Doc's garage. He's, got, he's, immo he's memorialized the fact that his mansion was destroyed. We're going to see his mansion early on. And wow, like his family's got some cash. It's pretty, pretty awesome that he can do that and just stay home and invent things all day. But it says the Brown estate sold to developers. So his last name is Brown, Dr. Brown, Dr. Emmett Brown. Um, his mansion was burned down. He's, he's an inventor. He's somebody that thinks outside of the box to come up with ideas that can help humanity. And mysteriously, it's never explained in full detail, um, his entire mansion that was presumably filled with his work and his writings and stuff burned to the ground just like so many inventors in reality in times past every time that somebody tries to do something or invent something that will help humanity their work seems to just be burned to the ground i could list a countless number of people but for the sake of time we'll just continue on all right then it shows you a picture of uh benjamin franklin and it looks like thomas edison so allegedly the inventor of the light bulb who he 
He's really not. And then Benjamin Franklin, both these guys associated with electricity, basically. Benjamin Franklin was smart enough to go out in a lightning storm, allegedly, and fly a kite with the key dangling off of it so that he would purposefully dr attract lightning. Sounds like a genius to me. All right, so, <laughs> um, which is interesting because when they pan out, they show you all this Burger King trash around these pictures. There's also Einstein in there. He's going to be in the movie a lot. Um, but right there, can you see that where it says specifically? See, they face these things towards the camera. They want certain parts of them. They don't want you to just see trash. They want you to see Burger King because they're, they're trying to, you know, make money uh, by allowing Burger King and there's a lot of product placement basically, but it says Whopper right there in front of you. Not just like, Oh, it's Burger King, whatever. It's a Whopper. A Whopper is a lie. Isn't that interesting? They put something that means a lie right next to these pictures of these famous guys who allegedly invented these things and took credit from other people in my opinion. All right. So we, we scroll through, we're looking at all these different clocks. Uh, there, is, there are appliances that are running by themselves. I talk about this phenomenon where, uh, where robots and, and machines and stuff actually come to life, just like in Terminator and Skynet. Um, you know, the concept of Skynet and stuff, uh, the brave little toaster. I mean, it's everywhere. It's in our subconscious collectively that machines will one day come to life by themselves. And, and this is showing you this where the coffee maker starting all by itself. It shows you a clock with Denver, which is interesting. Denver's highly associated with the um, secret groups and underground tunnels and stuff like that. Now we go to the TV. They zoom in on the TV, which means it's very important. We should take note of that. And the woman says a Libyan terrorist, terrorist group had claimed responsibility for the alleged theft. Somebody had stolen a, a large amount of plutonium and uh, some Libyan group took uh, took uh, responsibility for it. Anyways, Doc has it. We all know. All right. So we pan through the toasters going off all by itself. How many movies have you guys? How many can you list in the chat? I would love to see this. How many movies can you list where there is a toaster that seems to be alive and moving or working all by itself? Right. Um, I mean, I can think of a few. I'm interested to see if you guys think of one too, but that's, they use the toaster a lot, um, to show the symbolism of the machines coming to life and dancing about by themselves. Here, we've got a clock that has a glass dome around it, symbolic of the world that we live in. Um, and then over here is another one where it shows the world from top down. All right. Now this is an animated, uh, automatic dog, dog food machine that doc made for einstein so he doesn't have to feed him i love it genius saves him a lot of time uh so the can comes down the little mechanical arm grabs it and take a look at the can now keep in mind they could have used any it's not just product placement okay they choose specific products and as a byproduct they make money off of it but they choose these products because of the names that they have the names convey meaning and give context to the story that they're trying to tell that's the esoteric underlying story to the main entertaining one so cal can oh my god <coughs> i'm so sorry excuse me cal can why, why did they choose Calcan? What does that even mean, Calcan? We've lost touch with words these days. We have no idea what Calcan means. Half of us don't even know what our own names mean. Well, thankfully, I'm here. So I'm going to tell you what Calcan means. Cal comes from the root word coal. It's kind of hard to see right there, but I'll just read it to you. Uh, coal comes from Old Norse Cal, K-A-L. Both words are from Latin caulis, which means stem or stalk. So that part of the plant that is the straight beam or the pole or the rod that shoots up before the actual flowering and blooming part is called cal or coal, like old King Cole and stuff, right? Kali, interesting, sounds like Kali, right? Uh, also means stock, a stock. In ancient Native American tradition, they said that from one world to another, as, as mankind progresses, or as, at least as they themselves, the natives have progressed, that they climbed up a stock, a shoot, a rod, as, you know, an arrow or something like that. So this uh, cal comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word, kuli, kuli, kahuli. There's different ways to pronounce it, but basically it's kali. Uh, and it means stem of a plant or a stalk. Stem, stalk, or pole, as you can see right there. All right, so we're breaking down the name of the dog food real quick. This is why it's fun. Cal can. So cal means pole or, you know, similar variations. Con, 
comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word meaning to sing. So Khan is related to the word Kohen or Kohen, which meant early on uh, priest. It had, it had the connotation of a priest. The priests were the singers to God. The, the priests were the ones that spoke to God or spoke on behalf of God, etc. And they were typically called the Khans. So you'll see variations of Khan going back to these ancient singers to the gods, um, the priests. Uh, let's see. So it's, uh, it's the root for things like uh, chanter. If you're French, you know the word to sing is chante or chant in English, right? It's related to all those things. So calcon, what does calcon mean? It's a pole that sings. It's literally the singing sword symbolism all throughout our uh, pop culture. The singing sword, like where did that even come from? I know you've seen it. I know you've come across it somewhere. Uh, most notably in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the main character, Eddie Valiant, used a singing sword against Judge Doom, who happens to be Christopher Lloyd. The sword was drawn as Frank Sinatra singing Witchcraft, a play on the name of the sword. And here you go is a picture of it. It's that classic blue beam color, bluish white, baby bluish and white. And uh, the sword comes out pointy at first, but then it gets kind of flaccid and loose and plas it has some plasticity to it. That's because it's plasma. It's not an actual physical sword. It bends and it moves, etc. But that plasma that shoots up from the middle of the world called Vril makes a sound. It sings. Um, because it's, it's electricity on a massive scale and it, it, and it plays notes essentially. All right. Also, Cal is related to Superman's name, Cal L. L essentially means mighty leader or God and Cal, um, meaning pole. So he's, he's, Superman is another variation of the pole God or of the blue beam or of, you know, the blue stock or whatever, you know. All right. Then we pan over to the food drops down into Einstein's bowl. Now to me, it kind of looks like they're sending a message. They've already put the word Whopper in front of Einstein and the, and the rest of the cast. And now it kind of looks like something not too desirable is dropping down and piling up on top of Einstein. I'll let you use your imagination on that one. All right, Marty McFly walks in. He's he's carrying the classic skateboard and wearing the Nikes. The Nikes are uh, what people wear in the entertainment industry to let you know that they are the victors. Victors of what? Not of war, not of class, not of race. It is the victors of the apocalypse. They have survived. They have become victorious over the, the world ending, essentially. And their symbol is... Um, what could be interpreted as the vav, which is the hook, which is the pole, right? Or the rod. But it also looks to me like just sort of a swooshy, fancy form of the gimel. And the gimel in ancient languages looked like sort of like a check mark, exactly how you see there, but that one's more stylized. The check mark was really a foot, and it was a foot that was walking. That's why it's a check mark. It's a foot that's lifting up, attached to a leg, kind of like that. And uh, that's the gimel. The gimel is the G. In case you haven't noticed, and the G is used primarily in um, Masonic artwork and, and symbolism and stuff like that. You also see it directly in the center at the North Pole on some maps, and I'll show you that later. All right, so plutonium, boom. The skateboard just happens to bounce into the plutonium. We'll come back to the plutonium later. He goes over to some speakers. Marty McFly is a rock star, okay? Just like so many other awesome characters. Um, uh, Buckaroo Banzai is, is the first one that comes to my mind. Uh, and there's going to be some more shout outs to Buckaroo Banzai. He turns up the volume all the way. It's called over. He turns up the overdrive at first. I also did a breakdown on Maximum Overdrive, which is a movie where all the machines come to life all by themselves. Uh, so he gets his, his guitar out. He turns up the volume. It says that there's humming that starts to grow very loud. There is, this is because the, the, he has amplified the energy. Okay symbolically our world goes through amplification of energy right now we're going through the amplification of energy before the world pops and depressurizes causing another cataclysm and allowing people to wake up feeling like they have traveled through time or landed in some alternate world or something because they're going to wake up in a post-apocalyptic version of the world that they used to live in so there's a hum there's a hum worldwide it's called a world hum um, people call it different names, but they're strange sky sounds that are reverberating throughout our atmosphere and people hear them. Um, I believe it's also plasma, um, but it could also be the sky itself. So he goes in front of the speaker. I've actually shown you a clip of this a couple of times, how vibration and sound can move objects. It's the sound is about to move Marty quite a distance, turns it up. And as you see there, it says CRM 
114. That's not just random letters and stuff that, you know, we assume, oh, well, it must mean something for, you know, volume or music or it's not. It's a reference to something else. CRM 114, let's zoom in so you can read this with me. CRM 114 is stylized in a clockwork orange as Serum 114 is a series of letters and numbers used repeatedly in Stanley Kubrick's films and other media in reference to Kubrick's work. So Back to the Future is literally giving a shout out to Stanley Kubrick, um, at, at least in this particular instance. Why would they do that? What was Stanley Kubrick known for? What was he famous for as far as the underlying messages all throughout his movies? Something to think about. All right, so he, he busts out the pick. He's about to rock out. Hits it, and boom. Now, can you see right there? The reason I took a picture of this is not just to show you him getting blasted away, but it says down here at the bottom on the box, they put a lot of number eights in this movie. I don't know. It's kind of hard to... It's at the very bottom. I can't really show you. Anyways, the, one of the newspapers says number eight really big on it. Um, so we're going to get into that soon, too, the number eight symbolism. I'd love to hear what you think of the number eight in the chat, too. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say it's infinity and things like that, which is uh, also good. So the middle blows out of this speaker. Now, the speaker is an interesting shape because it's square, just like the old legends say that the earth had four corners to it. But then it also has this crater in the middle, kind of like our world. And then right from the middle, the middle blows out, causing Marty to go flying, literally and actually flying through the air. All right, uh, so he's, his feet go up. They make the Vav symbol, the V, the peace sign, whatever you want to call it. Um, and he's okay. He's all right. Can't remember why else I was showing. Some of these pictures I just took pictures of. Uh, so he calls he calls up Doc. He's in Doc's garage. Totally just blew up his all his expensive equipment. And he's like, oh, I found you. Can you meet me at the Twin Pines Mall tonight at 115? Doc wants him to meet up at 115. He's got an experiment. And it's specific. Why 115? Why not 116? Or why not 2 o'clock? You know what I mean? It's still the middle of the night or whatever. We could chalk it up to, oh, it's just random or whatever. But it's specifically 115 for a reason. It's going to lead up to a different time, which is symbolic. So 115 a.m., Twin Pines Mall. We're going to talk about the twin symbolism uh, as well. We have that a lot all throughout um all throughout our traditions and our cultures and our ancient beliefs and stuff where there are these twin gods, usually opposites of one another that fight one another all the time. And then you have the twin, the two turning into one. We're going to talk about the symbolism of that too. All right, so it's 8 o'clock now. The clocks are all chiming and going nuts. Marty's like, oh man, what's going on? It's 8 o'clock. And he's like, sweet, my experiment worked. So Doc has an experiment with time. Obviously, it's a time travel movie, right? But what is the experiment? He's never explained that. The movie doesn't really tell us, right? He says they're all exactly 25 minutes slow. Now, I didn't see any digital clocks at all. I mean, there, there may be some. I don't know. But to me, it looks like they're all really older kind of clocks. Um, these are the types of clocks that are good if, you're like, if you want to keep track of time. Um, because nowadays, all of, our, all of our clocks, most of them, um, are updated automatically through the internet and things like that or there's power outages and the clock resets and it turns off but many of these clocks are ones that will keep track of time regardless because they're wind up or whatever doc is keeping track of time and all of his clocks are 25 minutes slow that's one of the prophecies of the apocalypse jesus in the bible says that one of the things you should look for is that um the the Time itself will start to change. The days grow shorter. Now, if that's true and the days grow shorter, however, we're being deceived and our, our clocks are being reset to adjust for the increment of time or how fast the sun is moving around the world, um, that means that, the, that if you're keeping track of time with an analog clock, with a regular clock, um, and the time is speeding up, but we're making adjustments for it, pretending like it's not speeding up, then your, re your actual analog clocks will all show slower time. They'll all be slow. They'll all be in the past, essentially, which is what some of us do. I do that. I've got, I keep track of time and I uh, try not to update certain clocks and stuff. I don't do daylight savings time. I just keep in mind, you know, it's an hour forward or back. Anyway, so Doc is doing experiments, keeping track of time for some reason. So he's late for school. Marty's got to grab his, his skateboard. They show you the plutonium again. We're going to come back to the plutonium. Actually, we're going to do that right now. Pluto comes from Pluto. Plutonium comes from Pluto. And it says, Roman god of the underworld. Um, Pluto, Pluton, Greek Plut Plauton, the god of wealth from Plautos. Uh, wealth, Doc, 
They're both associated because uh, Pluto is the god of the underworld where the dwarves work and they mine for gold and gems and stuff uh, with, where there's a lot of valuable stuff. It comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word plu, plu, essentially, plu. That's how you say that, which means to flow. So plutonium is something associated with having a flow or also being in flux, to flow, to be in flux, etc., um, so we've got references to plasma essentially. Now this is Doc's house. Okay. This is where he just was. This is where uh, a lot of the movie takes place, but it's actually his garage. So some people might not have caught this. Marty leaves Doc's house and it happens so quick. You might not have noticed it, right? You think he's just going to go on this, you know, long skateboard thing or whatever, but wait a minute. Why is there a parking lot right in front of Doc's garage? That's not, those aren't Doc's cars, right? That's just a regular old park. All right. Well, Marty, Marty takes a quick turn but he's at burger king what the heck hold on rewind this there's doc's house doc lives next to burger king in the burger king parking lot i did not know that before until i was watching this movie breaking it down it happens so quick look at that there's parking spaces and everything right in front of doc's house so marty leaves boom burger king right there so this car happens to be coming out i'm sure there's no danger with this other car on the road you know Anyways, I just thought that was really interesting. Now, this is what a real city looks like. Okay, this is real. This is not a prop city. So then he turns the corner and all of a sudden now he's in a prop city. This, this does us good to recognize what's true from what's false. A lot of times things that, that um, appear to be true, basically things are not always as they appear, right? So he's on the back of this truck. He's waving at this uh, blue store where all these chicks are in there doing aerobics. And for some reason, they all see him and they're all waving at him or whatever. The blue color we're going to come back to. Um, and then they show you, here's the town, the, t the town of Hill Valley. Now, check this out. This is interesting. It says, the town square was called Mockingbird Square after the 1962 film to kill a mockingbird because it's not a real town you're looking at a set it's 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 in the back lot of universal studios basically but it was later known as the courthouse square it had been used for many films and television shows dating back to the 1948 uh an act of murder including the first 1959 episode of the sci-fi series the twilight zone also where is everybody uh the hill valley courthouse can be seen in the movies uh ah, i got some of it blocked off there uh, bye Bye Birdie, Sneakers, The Offspring music video, Why Don't You Get a Job, Major Dad episodes, uh, Who's That Blonde, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer as well. So that's that's some of the places you may have recognized this, uh, this, this lot from. All right, so he keeps on going. Now, keep in mind this image right here because this is, this is the image that the movie will end on where it's got this church that used to be a movie theater, right? Interesting. You go there for entertainment. And uh, we've got right next to it, it says Elmo's. We're going to come back to that. We've got Mary Goldie Wilson. We'll talk about Elmo. Elmo's on there too. So let's talk about Bruno. I mean Elmo. All right. Elmo in St. Elmo's Fire, a name given to uh, by seamen to the brushes and jets of electric lights that are seen on the tips of the masts and the yard arms, especially during storms. So, St. Elmo's Fire, right? That's where Elmo comes from. It's a reference to St. Elmo's Fire, which is plasma. Interesting, right? Right next to the cross, right next to the movie theater. We're going to talk about those as well. Elmo's related to Helm as well. Actually, check this out. I think there's something that says Helm in here. I don't see it right now. But it's related to the Helm. Uh, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word Kel, which means to cover, to conceal, or to save. Italian Elmo, same word, right? Helm, like Helm's Deep. Helm is a place that co covers, conceals, saves. It's the trunk of the Tree of Life. It is uh, the plasma volcano where Adam and Eve go to hide or leaf and leaf butter cedar. All right, so he goes, Marty McFly goes up to his old school. There's all this, like, what school looks like this? I don't know. Um, they wanted, Hill Valley is ghetto, okay? When I was a kid looking at this, I was like, oh, it's nice. I like Hill Valley, you know, like past or, or present, whatever. It's, it's a nice place. But man, when you really start looking into it, Hill, Hill Valley is like, it, it's got nice buildings and stuff like that, but it's super ghetto. It's super bad. It's in a fallen state, essentially. All this graffiti is everywhere. Marty runs up, sees his girlfriend, and uh, you can't see it. Let me, let, me, let me zoom this in a little bit. But some of, I want you to look at the graffiti. It's not real graffiti. They didn't hire gang members to come in and graffiti and tag up their, uh, their set or anything. They did it themselves. 
And if you look closely at some of these words, it says some interesting stuff in the graffiti. For example, Esau. <laughs> There's a lot of Jewish stuff in this movie. Uh, Esau is a reference to a twin, a red twin in the Bible. That's also going to come into play in a little bit. It also says trans X, and it looks like playmates. That's interesting. There's a lot of weird stuff written on this wall. I'll show you some more in a second. So she said, uh, he's like, yo, and uh, Jennifer's like, Marty, don't go this way. Strickland's looking for you. He's late for school or whatever. Uh, let's see. What is the name of Marty? Marty means, man, that's too small for me to read. Hold on. Let me zoom in on that. Ah, it means, it comes from the word martyr. Uh, there's, a, there's other variations too, but mostly martyr. And it means witness or stim. Isn't that interesting? A stim or a witness. It also means of Mars, which is why you'll see Marty is always wearing red. Okay. He's of Mars. He's, it's representative of those who live under a red sky when there's in our world, not out there on Mars or whatever. Our world is Mars when it turns red, when our sky turns red. And uh, there's increased buoyancy and stuff. So basically, we, it's like we live on a, on a different world. All right. Now, check us out. Look at some of this. Okay. I, I was looking at these. First of all, the word Bob, right? The name Bob is, is all over the place in this graffiti. I saw it all over the place. And then here it says, I had no idea what this word was, right? I'm, and I'm looking up words, doing research and stuff for all of you and, and for myself. And I'm like, smegma, what is that? Oh my God, I should not have looked that up. It's, uh, I, I, I didn't know what it was. I had to look it up. And then I'm like, oh my God, that's, yikes. It's, it's nasty, basically. There's a lot of nasty stuff. I don't even know. They didn't need to do that. You know what I mean? They could have put something else, all this sexual weird stuff in there. Anyways, yeah, it's gross. Um, so he says, uh, he's, he's meets, he gets in trouble for being late and he's like, He's like, I was hanging out with Doc. I was, I was at his house. And he says, uh, Doc, am I understand that you're still hanging around with Dr. Emmett Brown McFly? Dr. Emmett Brown. What does Emmett mean? Emmett is a Hebrew word. There's some more, you know, Hebrew Jewish connotation. Emmet means truth. It's the Hebrew word for truth. So already Christopher Lloyd represents, he's representative of like the blue beam of truth, etc. The Christ-like figure, etc. Brown, though. Why would they call him Brown, right? Brown seems like it would be the opposite of a bright, shining light. It's actually not. If you go back in time, the word Brown, as you can see here, is from the Proto-Indo-European root word, ber, which means bright, also brown, right? So brown itself used to be a bright color, it seems to me. The old English word also had a sense of brightness or shining. Ah, Dr. Brightness, Dr. Shining. He's a shining one. So that's what brown really means. Bruno, the reason we don't talk about Bruno, Bruno means brown and it means the light. It means the shining. It means the brightness, etc. right? Interesting, right? It, and it also is related to the word burnish, like whenever something is polished up and it's burnished or whatever and it shines. So he gives them tardies. They're late. Being late is something that happens with the apocalypse. Everyone expects the apocalypse to come, but it's always late, right? It, it always happens when they basically have given up on it. And then all of a sudden it, it, it arrives. Uh, and that's what Marty represents being uh, the representative of Mars in the color red. One for you, McFly. I believe that makes four in a row. Four. Remember the speaker, the four squares? Marty has a lot of four symbolism in this movie for the number of the world, an earthly grounded number, even though he's rebellious with the color red. So it's the earth red symbolism. All right. It says uh, the early Abrahamic concept of the world is similar to the Navajo concept of the world. This is the world on where the earth is an area of land floating in an ocean covered by a domed heaven. The domed heaven fits the land and the ocean like a lid with its edges on the horizon. The Navajo creation story traces the evolution of life through four previous worlds until the people reach the fifth world, the one that we're living in now. It says that um, upon arriving in the fourth world, the first man was not satisfied. Sounds like a man to me. Uh, the land was barren and he planted a reed, which is a pole, which is a stalk, which is a stem, etc. And the reed grew up to the roof of the fourth world, touching the sky. 
Uh, this so-called Dr. Brown is dangerous. He's a real nutcase. That's what people like Strickland represent in our world. Um, our world is basically the world that you're seeing right now, and it's got all these bullies and stuff and uh, slave classes and everything. And this is this is how they look at inventors. This is how they look at people who think outside of the box, people who are a little off or different or not as mainstream and accepted, right? They try to tell us, stay away from them. They're nutcases. They're weirdos. They're different. You know what I mean? It's this team mentality that's something I'm not really into any longer. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, I noticed your band is on the roster. Marty's got a band. Did you know that? Yeah, he's a rock star like we talked about, right? His band's on the roster for the dance auditions after school. So there's a there's a band audition or something taking place. It's exciting. It's all about this music, right? The battle of the bands, essentially. Uh, why even bother McFly? You don't have a chance. That's the, the, that's the bullies of the world talking to us, right? Don't even try. You're not going to make it. You're doomed to fail. And that, those are the boundaries. Those are the blocks that they put. Those are the spells that they cast. It, they don't need a lot of people holding us back from our own freedom. All they need to do is convince us to hold ourselves back. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Well, there's a lot of interesting things being said there. First, no McFly ever amounted to anything. That's not even true. If you know the movies, Hill Valley was founded upon the actions of the McFlies, as you'll see. Um, and then Hill Valley itself is an interesting name. We're gonna, I'm going to show you some symbolism of what Hill Valley is. It sounds like it's an oxymoron or a contradiction, but it's not. He says, yeah, well, history is going to change. Yes, the ones, the sons of those who fly, right? McFly is what that means, um, are going to change history. And he goes to his audition. He's got his band there. He says, we're, uh, we're the pinheads. So the pinheads want to try out. Not related to like the, the movie Hellraiser or anything because that actually came out after this movie. Um, but more like like the age old question how many angels can you fit on a pinhead right on the tip of a pin or whatever all right so anyways uh he starts rocking out and this guy is one of the judges and he's like um uh, you're too loud i'm sorry you're just too loud and they're playing this song called the power of love rocking out it's by huey lewis in the news that is huey lewis <laughs> isn't that interesting what a cool cameo they put the guy that's actually singing the song power of love as the guy who's like oh sorry i don't like it you're too loud or whatever i'm sure he's been told that wild stallions love it though they agree they're like they're probably i think they were next in line or something anyways we go to back to mayor goldie wilson <laughs> the, he's trying to re be reelected. he has a gold tooth like i knew that in the past but i never really don't picked up that they put a gold tooth um with him in the future so marty starts walking now this is interesting too look at the license plate off to the side you see that it says for mary that's not a real license plate that's 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 a vanity plate that's been made up as a prop for mary interesting mary like the mother of jesus and then all of a sudden we've got Marty who meets up with his girlfriend. And then she says, you can put your mind, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. She's giving him words of wisdom. He's, he's, Morpheus would be like, were you paying attention to your girlfriend, Marty? Or were you looking at the woman with the red butt? <laughs> like, cause that's pretty much what he's doing. He's distracted, right? He gets distracted instead of listening and focusing on the path, right? She grabs him and says, Hey, Pay attention. That's good advice, Marty. All right. Anyways, uh, Marty sees this truck, the four by four. There's some more fours associated with Marty. Uh, and he's like, that's hot, etc." Oh, the gas war. They're having a gas war. The prices are, whoo, man, look at that. A dollar and nine cents and nine tenths of a cent. Whew. Crazy times back then. I'm glad it's not like that these days or anyway uh so marty grabs his girlfriend there's the clock tower that that you're all familiar with and this lady's like save the clock tower we're taking donations right then he's like here here's a quarter a quarter is a fourth there's another four with marty right now if you look back behind her let me make this a little bigger so you can see it boom ah it's hard to see because it's so high up uh but you can see right here you can see that there's the hand right? This is a, a tarot card, spiritual, psychic type of a place. And then they've got the triangle with the all-seeing eye behind it. You can see it a little better above, but it's hard for me to get up there to show you. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the eye with the triangle, which is the, um, the uh, plasma volcano symbolism, basically. You'll find that at the middle of the world. And then right next to that, we got Luz Aerobic Fitness Center. Interesting. That's going to change into something different here in a minute. 
Uh, and then behind him, look at what the movie theater is showing. This, this town is trash. What a trashy town, right? It says orgy American style. They're just straight up showing adult films. Like downtown, putting it up for everyone. To see. This, uh, it's... I, I'm not into that kind of stuff. I know that you know most people in the world today are. Um, to me, that's all oh, yuck. Like it should that shouldn't be out in the towns like that. That's just showing the fallen state of the of the world that he lives in currently, right? Which is our world. And then his girlfriend writes her phone number on the back, giving the classic five five five, which is really V V V in Roman numerals, which is really Vav Vav Vav, which is really six 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 in ancient Phoenician. So 555 equals 666 symbolism. And then he goes to his uh, home. There you can see this. It's got like these two pillars on each side. It's called the Lion or Leon Estates. I'm going to come back to that one when you can see it better. All right. So he goes into his house and we've got uh, old Biff the bully and his dad. Biff is just totally bullying on the dad. The dad's laughing away and I feel sorry for him because I've done this before. You know, have, have you ever been picked on, you know, in school or something? I mean, you just kind of laugh as they're doing it because you're weak, you know, and you're, you only know how to do good. Like you don't know how to, you don't know how to stand up for yourself. We don't, we're not taught these types of things, right? So this is going to show you the change when we empower ourselves, when we, ch when we take time into our own hands and change the future, we can change what happens instead of being picked on and stuff by the bullies. His dad's just cracking up at everything. He laughs instead of crying, in my opinion, basically. Uh, the dad also has a big heaping bowl of sweets. There's sweets all over this movie. Like all people eat, all people drink in this movie is like beer and Pepsi. That's pretty much it. Like they're just feeding parasites basically in the future and in the past. All right, so Marty is looking at him like, "Okay, you know, you're acting kind of weird. The mom is an alcoholic is what we're is what it's implied here." So she's drinking herself, you know, trying to just make the best of life or whatever. You can tell she's depressed. You can tell she's not happy with her life. And she's talking about the night that they met during that terrible thunderstorm, right? The terrible thunderstorm is the apocalypse, right? There, whenever you see a huge storm that kicks off some sort of change, that's representative of the tempest that arises when the world depressurizes. Marty arrives at the Twin Pines Mall at 1.16 a.m. Now, that's why I said that, that they choose these times specifically. That is uh, esoterically 911 if you flip it around if you turn it upside down it's 911 uh which, which is going to be shown quite a few times we also have the twin pines symbolism the two pines the two towers the two trees the two poles the two beams and you're going to see what happens there's always those two towers and you already know what happens to those right they're replaced with one and that's uh that's symbolic of the cosmic plasma discharge formations that we see uh, during the apocalypse and in going into the next world. Marty is rocking his vest. I used to have a vest just like that. Those are comfy, man. I should get it. I should get it. I should bring those back. Those are comfy. Um, but I'm going to talk about his vest a little bit here in the future because when he goes into the past, they don't know what that is. All right. So we see the car. The car comes out, pulling out, and there's all this it looks like smoke or vapor or something coming out with it. Right. The license plate says out of time, but there's all this smoke that comes out. Why would there even be all? It's not smoke. Otherwise, Doc wouldn't have been able to breathe. Right. I would assume. So it's vapor. It's vapor that's coming out of this truck when it didn't have vapor before. All that vapor is coming, pouring out of it, which implies a depressurization event. It could be all kinds. I mean, Doc could have, you know, he could have a vape pen or, or who knows? I don't know. He could be doing all kinds of stuff in there. But... Um, I, I see the, the symbolism of it being vapor, especially given the fact that the car is covered in ice when it returns, which we'll see. So he's like, oh, uh, wow. Hey, what's up, Doc? A DeLorean, a DeLorean. Wow, the car is a DeLorean. This is cool. Uh, so it's a big deal that the car is a DeLorean. What does DeLorean mean? Instead of just calling something, whatever the label is, we should understand its meaning, the meaning of the names, whatever we name stuff. Naming something used to be an honor because you're descri you get to describe it right? I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious. Like, like babies were not named until after they were born because you couldn't describe something you haven't met yet, right? So people would give a description after the child was born. We have lost touch with names. So I like to break down the names because the names are specifically chosen for, for, for context. DeLorean's origin and meaning. The name DeLorean is a boy's name meaning from the laurels, 
What's a laurel? Well, you, you might have seen the ancient Greeks wearing like, you know, some leaves around their head as a little crown or something. Those leaves are laurel leaves. Uh, they, they look like that. Uh, comes from the word lor, L-A-U-R, which means a spike, specifically, usually a spike of iron, which is a nail, which is symbolic for the ancient picture for the vav, the number six in Phoenician and Hebrew. So, de lorian means of the spike or of the nail. The etymology, let's take a closer look at it. Um, uh, del, what is this? Uh, Middle Dutch del. So, del Orion. So there's there's various ways you could you could you could translate the word. Okay, I'm not saying that my way is correct or anything, but there's different ways uh, that you can translate these letters depending on how they are put together. This one would be Del Orion. Del means valley, a, a dune valley. In Hill Valley, we have this central figure of the the, the car, which is Del or valley, and then Orion. Or means light or fire. Okay, and then Ian just means of the essentially. So the car literally could be interpreted as meaning um, Valley of Light, the Valley of Light, Hill Valley, right? In interesting stuff. Uh, it also means a depression or a dune valley, and it's a cognate from the English Del. So Del Orion, the light of the valley. Why is that important, by the way? I can, I'm, I'm going to reference the valley a lot. It is the Garden of, of Eden, okay? It is paradise. It is this, the central location, the land that used to be at the North Pole, which is surrounded by mountains. All right, so Doc gets out of the car. The car is filled with vapor all over the place. It, this signifies that it just went through a depressurizing event. The pressure on the inside is different from the pressure on the outside. So when, when there's that gradient or that, that, that rapid pressure release from one to another, it expands the air it expands the atmosphere and turns it into mist, essentially. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so Doc gets out of the car. He looks at the clock. He's like, all right, I'm going to send Einstein into the future. The time right now, 119. Boom. Also, 911. Backwards, right? If you read it backwards, it's also those same numbers, 9 and then 1-1. One, one. The 9 is the tet. The tet is the symbol for the North Pole. It is a circle with a cross in the middle of it, the four lands and the four rivers. Um, and then 1-1 one, one is 11, which is the two the two towers, right, that shoot up as well. The two, the two beams of light on either side of Mount Maru, we'll say. We'll come back to that one too. All right. Uh, let's take a break. I want to take a quick break. 339 people watching. Thank you. I appreciate all of you. I'm going to take a quick break. That way we can use the bathroom, grab a drink or something, and there's a lot more to cover. We're going to speed things up going into uh, the next section here. So I'll see you guys in less than two minutes. Around the world men's thoughts will fly Quick as the twinkling of an eye And water shall great wonders do How strange, and yet it shall come true Beneath the water men shall walk Shall ride, shall sleep, shall even talk And in the air men shall be seen In white and black and even green For in those wondrous far-off days The women shall adopt a craze To dress like men in trousers wear And to cut off their locks of hair They'll ride astride with brazen brow as witches do on broomsticks now there'll be a sign for all to see be sure that it will certain be then love shall die and marriage cease and nations wane and babes decrease as wives shall fondle cats and dogs and men live much the same as hogs pictures alive with movements free boats like fishes beneath the sea when men like birds shall scour the sky then half the world deep drenched in blood shall die then half the world deep drenched in blood shall die. 
For those who live this century through, in fear and trembling this shall do, flee to the mountains and the dens, to bog and forest and wild fens, for storm will rage and oceans roar, when Gabriel stands on sea and shore, and as he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds die and new be born. Fiery dragon will cross the sky six times before this earth shall die, mankind will tremble and frightened be for the six heralds in this prophecy. For seven days and seven Seven nights, man will watch this awesome sight. The tides will rise beyond their ken to bite away the shores, and then the mountains will begin to roar. And earthquakes split the plain to shore, and flooding waters rushing in will flood the lands with such a din. That All right, sweet, we're back. That was less than two minutes. Uh, just a quick bathroom break. Let's pick up where we left off. So Marty sees the DeLorean. The dog named Einstein is inside of the car. And uh, Doc's like, hey, you need to record this, right? You need to record this for posterity. And he says, okay, you got that? And he says, right, check, Doc, check, right? That check mark, the gimel, like I was talking about earlier, this is what it actually looks like in Hebrew. So there you can see it kind of looks like a high-heeled shoe or something because it's a foot. Um, and then in the old pictorial form, you see it looked more like a check mark. Uh, that's a foot that is in the action of walking. It, it basically signifies... A place, the place where you stand, the, a destination, the place where you go, or traveling, or action, and things like that. Now, here's an old map of the world. Uh, this, is, this is one that I've shown many times on my channel. Right in the center, at the very north pole, is the letter G, the Gimel. Interesting. It's almost like it's telling us to go there. All right, so he says, when this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious stuff, <laughs> right? He doesn't say that. Anyways, um, 88 miles an hour. 88, he has, to, he has to get to 88 miles an hour. Just the, the number 88 is also in this sort of time traveling type of vehicle that Buckaroo Bonsai have, his, his rocket car that allows him to change locations to basically the eighth dimension, I believe. Uh, and then, of course, he has to get up to 88. So there is the the two eights. I have a lot of I have a lot of ideas about the 88 symbolism. Mostly, my number one idea is that it represents the boundary at the North Pole, 88 degrees latitude. Um, you have to get to 88 degrees latitude, then you're going to see some serious stuff, like the world's going to start changing. Uh, as the closer you get to 90 degrees, the closer you get to the very top, the very center. I should say. All right, so he gets to 88. Boom, the car starts to turn that baby blue color, that light blue that represents uh, the blue beam in the middle of the world. That is what makes time travel possible because I don't think it's really time travel. I mean, that's just me. I love the movie. I love all time travel movies. But honestly, I'm not even the biggest, I'm not super convinced that like time travel is real. I don't know. I mean, I, it's possible, definitely possible. But I see it more as... The time travelers are those who survive the apocalypse or those sliders who leave the world during an apocalyptic event and they go to an alternate earth where everything is slightly different, right? There's all these different alternate earths out there. Just some different weird theories from myself. As you can see, the car makes it so bright. Marty has to close his eyes. Doc is shocked and the car is coming right at them. I guess he did this for dramatic effect, which is kind of cool. I like Doc. The car turns that blue color exactly like Buckaroo Banzai's car does. It even shoots out a bluish white beam. And then he says, uh, besides, he's, he's talking about the DeLorean, and he says, the stainless steel construction uh, made the flux dispersal, and then the car is about to come back, so he doesn't get to finish that sentence. It's like, right? And he's like, he was going to talk about how the car is made of stainless steel, which acts as uh, dispersing the flux or the flow of the electricity around it, which means it's a Faraday cage. That's what Doc was trying to say. It's a natural Faraday cage. That's why I used it. That's why I picked it. Uh, here's a picture of a Faraday cage. The person inside is totally safe from electricity, lightning, plasma, etc. Here's another one. I like this one because it looks more like the time machine by H.G. Wells and the actual time machine in that movie or book. Uh, so the car comes back and it's, he's like, ah, ah, he touches it. Oh my God. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it, is, is it hot? 
He's like, no, no, it's cold. It's damn cold. So something turning cold unexpectedly also is an indicator that there was a rapid depressurization event. When you have low pressure, things become colder, right? The atmosphere, the weather, everything becomes colder. High pressure means things become hotter, right? So the car has gone through this depressurization event symbolically, right? In the movie, they're traveling through time. But I believe that the esoteric symbolism is harkens to the world depressurizing and this car, you know, going through the wormhole, the Einstein Rosen bridge, if you will. And, uh, it's cold up there. It's very cold. Anyways, he checks, uh, the clock. He's like, Einstein's clock is one minute behind mine and still ticking one twenty one now, right? One, two, one. That's used a lot in this movie. I started this live stream at one twenty one PM purposefully one, two, one, the one and the one, the 11 or Elvin. That's also the two towers. Okay. The two towers in the middle of the two towers, the two pillars of light at the North pole on either side of the Island, um, from, uh, the other magnetic poles, there's probably like three, I believe. And, um, so you've got one tower, one tower, and then the two is in the middle. Why would two be in the, why would they choose one, two, one like that? Right. We've got two towers. And then in between the two towers, symbolically throughout history, there've been these gods that are holding shown depicted as holding on to staves or rods or sticks or animals of some sort on each side, etc. Uh, and it's, it's symbolic of these particular gods. Um, the God's name is two, um, in some, in some, uh, regions. Anyway, so Doc is explaining how it all works, right? And he's like, let's say you want to see the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, blah, 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 blah. types it in, right? Um, which is, which is interesting. And then he's like, oh, how about you want to see the birth of Christ? So he types in Christmas day, zero, 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 the year. There is no year zero, 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 just so you know, right? Um, <laughs> so the moment that it's like one second in, into that year, we would say it's the year one, even though it's less than one, we would still say it's the year one. It's interesting how that works. Anyways, December 25th, that's also Christmas day. That's also Christmas day catastrophe. That's referenced in so many movies. That's one of the times when the apocalypse arrives, right? Lights turn out three days before. Then we have the arrival, the birth of the light, the light of the world. And then he says, or how about this? Here's a red letter day, red day. Interesting. In science, November 5th, 1955, three, five symbolism. Again, the five, five, five is the six, six, six. Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I see no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. November 5th comes up quite a, quite a few times in the movies and pop culture. Uh, let's see. This is the flux capacitor. He says, this is what makes time travel possible. In the same way that I showed you the gamel and the symbolism, I will now show you the vav. The vav is symbolic for a nail, something that you, a peg that is, that is shooting up out of the ground, essentially that, that reaches up towards the sky. And this is how they used to draw it, right? This is more like modern Hebrew. Uh, it's a nail. That's all it is. And this is the old version. This was less of a nail and more of a tent peg that branched out at the top so they could wrap a rope around it, basically. And this is the flux capacitor. This is the vav. This is the uh, peg, the root, the the pole, the 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 sky beam, um, the Jack's beanstalk, which is we're also going to see that too. So. Oh, here it is right here. So this is actually Christopher Lloyd once again. Hello, Christopher Lloyd. Um, in the movie, Jack and the Beanstalk, one of the many variations of it, where he is a professor. He's the headmaster who teaches all of these fairy tale children, including Jack from Jack and, Jack and the Beanstalk. And then on the board, you can see that there's the flux capacitor right there. And it says, make a note of this. In a movie where Jack has to climb the tree of life, he has to climb the beanstalk to go into the next world, just like the Hopi and so many other Native American, you know, Navajo and people talk about. We have Christopher Lloyd. We have a connection with the flux capacitor and the Vav once again. In the 2004 film, The Polar Express, the flux capacitor can be seen inside the cab of the Berkshire 1225 steam locomotive in a scene where two engineers of the train are trying to re retrieve a loose cotter pin during the journey to the North Pole. So there it is right there. Uh, you can, you know, I got to zoom in. Let's zoom in on it so you can see it better. Why not? 
So there's one of the engineers or whatever, and there's the flux capacitor. You'll have to get the movie in, you know, if you want to see it better or whatever. But they have the flux capacitor on the Polar Express, which goes to the North Pole. The North Pole is the middle of the world. It's the Garden of Eden, etc., right? So we've got more connections there. Then he looks around. He's like, old man Peabody owned all of this. Peabody. Interesting. Why? This is, let's, let's figure out what does Peabody mean. Peabody. This unusual and intriguing name is of early medieval English origin. It derives from the nickname for someone considered to be a showy, colorful dresser. It comes from Middle English pe, from peacock, peacock, a colorful or bright bird, right? Pe, bright, pet, colorful, etc., right? Uh, also, pea body, colorful or bright body, a body of light, essentially, right? Which is uh, the squatter man symbolism. Pe, pea body, interesting. So, pe is directly related to the Vietnamese word pho. You may have seen many restaurants that say pho, and there's a type of like noodles and stuff called pho and stuff. Pho comes probably from the French word phu, which means fire, fue. Fu, fue, all these different variations, uh, as in pot o fu, o fu. I don't know how to say that word, even though I speak French. I speak a little French, I should be honest. Uh, I don't speak as much as I used to. Anyways, uh, so fo means fire, okay? Or by extension, light, or the reverse of that. Fo, pe, means fire. P body is light body. Uh, also, p is related, as in pea body, to the Greek pison. The P, Pison. Well, that's interesting. Pison is one of the names of the rivers in the Garden of Eden. It's called Pishon, right? So if you take a look at this map of the four lands that used to exist up there on maps in the ancient times, they will show you the plasma volcano at the middle of the world, also called Rupus Negra. They'll show you the four rivers. One of these rivers is the Pison, right? And it's directly related to that. It surrounds the land of Havila, which they say, um, it says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From there, it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon or Pison. And it is one that skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is very good. And there's bdellium and onyx stone and riches. So just like we talked about Pluto being the god of wealth and riches and stuff, we also have another, another reference to a rich land connection to the North Pole as well. So Doc comes out and he's like, uh, you know, it requires plutonium. Uh, we've already gone over Pluto, plutonium. Uh, from the English, from the Proto-Indo-European pl, meaning to flow, just like a river would flow. The 1.21 gigawatt, gigawatts or gigawatts of electricity that I need. The one, the two, and the one. We'll come back to that again later on. All right. So Doc throws up the symbol that he should because he represents the beam of light, as he does in so many other movies, right? Or electricity, etc. But he puts up the squatter man symbolism, the sign of peace, meaning please don't shoot me, please don't kill me. But this guy says. Forget it. Um, the, he's from Libya. These are the Libyans, right? They could have chose any country, um, you know, any Middle, Middle Eastern. It could be Russians. It doesn't matter. But they chose Libya purposefully for the root that it means. Also, take a look at the Volkswagen symbolism. This is the three Vavs in a row. You'll see Vav, Vav, and Vav, the three Vs there in the Volkswagen symbolism. Is there a line there? I don't know. There's, uh, you know, the Mandela effect says that there is no longer a line there. To me, it looks like there's a line there. It's interesting. Uh, Mandela effects. We'll actually, we're actually going to come back to Mandela effects later on. So, uh, November 5th, 1955. we got the three fives again. We've got 88 miles an hour. And then right there, you can't see it because the tape is black. But right there, it actually says, get to 88. As in, get to the 88th par parallel in the world right? Symbolically speaking. Let me check the time. All right, we're good on time. Let's keep going. So Marty is like, he's get, trying to get away from the Libyans. He doesn't want to get shot. He jumps in the car. He's like, let's see if you bastards can do 90. Boom. It lights up baby blue, whitish light from the blue, from the blue beam. The Vav is going off. And then he travels through time, right? Which is probably, in my opinion, an apocalyptic event. He's going to an alternative earth or whatever. Or he has survived, he's still on Earth, and it's just that we've been thrown back into the Stone Age, we've lost all of our modern conveniences, etc. First thing that he sees is a scarecrow. The first thing that he sees when he arrives in this new time, or new world, or new environment, is a scarecrow, much like another traveler from another popular movie, The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy, who wears the blue also, 
is walking the path and she comes and the first character she meets on her journey is the scarecrow. Once again, the man on the pole. She comes face to face with the man on the pole. That's where everyone goes. The wise men go to the, 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 um, the star of Bethlehem, right? Uh, they see the light of the world, etc. Anyways, uh, so he crashes into this barn and the car <laughs> looks a lot like a UFO. It opens up. The farmers that, you know, come out there are like, oh my God, look, it looks just like in this comic book. This is a this is a reference to not only what the movie was going to be called, which is like Spaceman from Pluto or something ridiculous. There's a lot of weird alternatives that the script had that did not make it into the movie. And if you're interested in the movie, I highly recommend checking out these alternative scripts. Uh, shocking science fiction. So shocking is in there. Uh, space zombies from Pluto. We've got a Pluto reference again with the DeLorean. The DeLorean meaning of the laurels or of the garden, right? Is one of the translations. He comes out. He's he's dressed up in the appropriate gear that he used to have on. They don't. They're not used to seeing that, so they think that he's an alien. We have depictions of alien creatures that have visited our world or alien beings, and people have drawn them all weird, exactly what they look like, and we just we just assume that they were all on drugs or that they were all you know what I mean. But what if they drew exactly what they saw? They just didn't understand what it was, right? And then he, Marty takes off. He gets back in the time machine. He's, he takes off and he runs over one of the pines. Remember, it's twin pines. Old man Peabody had two pines, two towers, two trees, and they're run over. So now there's only one. So how do you think that might affect the twin pines naming of the mall in the future when he goes back, right? Uh, he also shoots at the post. The mailbox is called the post, right? So he takes, Marty takes out one of the posts and then Peabody figuratively and symbolically takes out a post himself or a beam or a pole, etc. He says, you space bastard, you killed my pine. And they call him Pa. Interesting. Pa is related to Pe, which is light or fire as we talked about, right? All right. So Marty goes back to where his home should be and his home hasn't been built yet in its in, in its, instead, they have the two pillars. They have the two columns there. I want to show you. Let's zoom in on this real quick. It's called Leon Estates. Some people just say lion because there is a lion up there. The word lion is directly related to it as well. And there's pine cones. Interesting. Another reference to pine or pen, right? Which we're going to talk about as well. So let's see what the, we got here. Leon. If we look up the origin of the name Leon. Now, keep in mind the McFlies are Irish. They, they mention it. Uh, in this movie and in, uh, all over the place in part three, right? So let's look at what up. Let's look at what up. Let's look it up and see what it means in Irish. Leon, the last name Leon, it says in Ireland the name originated in Galway and it comes from the ancient Irish name Olaufin or Olachlin. Lachin. Uh, the O prefix means grandson of, right? O means grandson of, Mac means like son of, or descendant of. Lachlan was, or Lachin, or Leon, was an old Gaelic word for gray. Another theory is that the word Lachin meant spear or javelin. So we've got gray, once again, which also means sh shining, essentially, like Gandalf, like, uh, like the dock and stuff. But then we also have the connotation of a spear or a javelin. This is very interesting. So if, if we zoom in on this, it actually says uh, another theory that the word meant spear or javelin. Families in Ireland used to take their name from the leader of the clan. So it's likely that the Leones are descended from a gray leader or had a gray leader or from a warrior leader who used a spear, just like the blue beam is portrayed as holding up, you know, spears and stuff like that. The, the, the beam itself is a, a spear, an arrow, and all those types of things, right? And then Leon Estates, there's a billboard for what's coming, right? Leon Estates. So if Leon is related to the word beam, spear, javelin, pillar, etc., then Leon Estate means land of the pillars, Land of the Pillars. Uh, there is a mystical land, just like Atlantis, in Isl Islamic belief. 
um, and they call it the Land of the Pillars, right? It's, I forgot the actual name of it off the top of my head, but it's called the Land of the Pillars, and nobody knows where it is or where it was located. It's kind of one of those lost cities. So he's back in 1955, walking around. First thing we see is a poster for a movie that stars Ronald Reagan. And then in the background, they're singing Mr. Sandman. He just went through this apocalyptic type of symbolic event, and they're singing Mr. Sandman. I've done a video just recently on the Sandman and the Sandman symbolism. So I highly encourage you to check that out if you want to know more about the Sandman symbolism. Let's look at Ronald Reagan, though. Why do they feature him in this so much? When you think of Ronald Reagan, most of us think of something like this, an image of, you know, some old president that lived during the 80s or whatever, right? But that's not Ronald Reagan, really, right? He had a whole life before he was voted to become the president. Basically, he was an actor. He starred in many different movies. He wasn't, you know, political in any way that, I, that I'm aware of. He was an actor. He was in Hollywood. He pretended to be other characters, essentially, right? This is, these are all Ronald Reagan right here. Um, and these are many different movies. Look at all these different movies that he's done. I had no idea Ronald Reagan did so many movies. All right. So anyway, um, we look at the gas station. Now the price has dropped to 19 and a half cents per gallon, right? Look at the difference between the way the world was, right? When we go back in time, things seem to be better. When we go forward in time, things seem to be worse until it reaches a juncture where everything changes and we enter into a golden age once more. This is how customer service used to be. This is what people used to do when they got gas. I many of you younger people will have no idea of like, You'll think this is something else. This is the norm. When you pulled up to a gas station, you had like four, five, six people coming out. Like you're a NASCAR driver. They're putting air in the tires. They're, you know, they're washing the windows and stuff. Like stuff that homeless people try to do now to like get a buck. You know what I mean? They're doing it for free as a service because they provided full service. Now they do none of the work. You do all of the work. The slave class goes in and they do everything themselves, which is interesting to me. All right, so then they're singing Mr. Sandman, and they say, please turn on your magic beam. Mr. Sandman, when did he get a magic beam? <laughs> right? What does a magic beam have to do with it? I mean, I know a bag of sand and stuff. What's this beam business, right? The beam, and then they show you the columns behind the clock tower, the four columns. Four, once again, associated with Marty. Uh, the four columns, the four towers, also made their appearance in uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. We saw that one too, with some sort of prize in the middle. This, up here, you can see it's like the all-seeing eye and the pyramid symbolism. The clock tower. It's not really a tower, though, is it? We're going we're gonna to come back to that, that etymology. So he looks up at the clock tower. He sees that it's ringing and it's now working, etc. We've got the four pillar symbolism. Let's talk about Hill Valley. Why did they name this place Hill Valley? Well, as I've mentioned, it is reference and paying homage to the Garden of Eden, the place where time travel is possible, the place where you can leave this world or stay here and be protected within uh, the helm, within this mountain here. Let's zoom in on it. As you can see, there's uh, hills all the way around this old land in the North Pole. This is because of electricity. Electricity plays a part in creating these formations, these valleys and hills and stuff. And it's very interesting to see, but this is a valley that has a literal hill in the middle or a mountain in the middle or a plasma volcano, etc. right? Rupus Negra. And it's also a valley because it's surrounded by mountains. It's an enclosure. All right. So now it's uh, Mayor Red Thomas running for mayor. This is interesting, right? Progress is his middle name. Okay, this is interesting to me. Red Thomas. Thomas means twin. Remember earlier they wrote Esau in the, in the graffiti and it was a reference to a red twin? Here's another reference to a red twin. It's the twin of our world of the blue sky that we live under today. There is a red sky. It's a twin world, etc. All right, it goes back. More 555 symbolism. We already talked about that. He opens up the newspaper. They're talking about Red Thomas, but let's look at the newspaper. It says, you'll be noticed driving the car of the future. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He's literally driving. He's actually driving a car of the future. Um, that's, I thought that was interesting. Then they have him standing here looking, and he's like, this has got to be a dream. They have, symbolically, there's a one and a nine. 19. 19 is the number of the fallen angels in the book of Enoch listed as, as the leaders. Um, and then it says elite right here off to the side. You can see it says elite barbershop. Elites are like the people that run the world, rule the world, right? The best of the best, the cream of the crop. Um, Loki was one of the original 
uh, barbers because Loki, there's a story that's saying that Loki, the God went and cut off, you know, um, I think it was his sister's hair or something, got in a bunch of trouble. We broke that down when we, when we talked about truth in movies, Loki, uh, but the barbershop represents the cutting off of the God's hair or the goddess's hair or, uh, the hair. What's that one Rapunzel in the tower and her hair. There's always this hair cutting business going on. It's not hair. Symbolically, it's plasma strands that are coming down that just fall. They stop because that electromagnetic dome goes back up and cuts off the hair of the sky god. Uh, and then the nine in the background is the Tet, also showing you that you are in the North Pole land, symbolically. He, now, the first place he goes to is Lou's Cafe. Lou's Cafe is represented by a blue column. You see that? There's a column right there. Lou's Cafe. Boom. Column. That's that's the symbol. That's his logo. And then there's these two columns right here and right here. And in the middle, there's fountain service. Isn't that interesting? Just like the fountain of youth. Uh, all right. Anyway, so he goes inside. He starts talking to Lou. And he's like, hey, what's with the life preserver? Right? They've never seen a vest before. <laughs> I don't understand what it is. Um, what is with the life preserver? Why do they keep on? Why did they insist on making the characters like think that he's wearing a life preserver? Right? Because it makes him buoyant. It makes him way less. And he represents Mars. He represents the red sky where everything is more buoyant and weighs less. That's why he's walking around wearing a life preserver, something that makes him more buoyant. He looks up uh, Doc Brown's. Doc Brown lives on the riverside, which we talked about the riverside Pichon, right? He says, hey, uh, do you know where 14, 1640 Riverside Drive is? Hey, are you going to order something, kid? This is another thing. You see, Marty's used to the world where you have to go in and, and put your own gas in the car and all that stuff. And they're disconnected from the people standing right in front of them. Just like many of you are probably disconnected from me actually being a regular guy and having a life and stuff. And it's okay. It's, it's cool because I like to get lost in the entertainment aspect as well, basically. And that's okay. But I just want to point this out. The way that Marty is treating Lou right now, terrible, terrible. He's, he's treating Lou just like we treat other people, like they're here to serve us. Like they don't have independent lives of their own. Like they're not our equals, right? So he starts asking him questions like he's Google. And then Lou's like, are you going to order something? Like, are you serious? You just come in here demanding things from me, right? Are you going to order something or what? You know what I mean? He didn't even say hello. Like, hey, what's up, Lou? Nice place. This is cool. You know what I mean? It's very disconnected. And that's the world that Marty just came from. Now we've got Biff coming in with his gang of bullies. Uh, let's see. In the background, there's a, a travel service. I might come back to that travel service later. But Biff, Biff makes his appearance. And Biff's like, yeah, you got my homework finished? Biff represents the bullies in the world today that have slave classes that do all of the work for them and then they take all of the credit for it, right? Um, I mean, I, I feel like that explains itself. So he knocks him on the head. Hello, hello, anybody home, McFly? Think, McFly, think. The bullies of this world do that to us. They might not grab you physically and knock on your head, but they are telling you what to think. They're telling you how to think, what to do, and they're getting everyone else involved and, and in on it so that there's all this peer pressure so that you don't want to look stupid or look like a, a dork or a nerd or out an outcast or black sheep, right? All right, and then he says, oh, another life preserver reference. This dork thinks he's going to drown, right? So there's another reference to the lifesaver. They want you to pick up on the fact that this is supposed to look purposefully like a device that makes you buoyant, that makes you weigh less purposefully. So Marty follows him back. His dad's doing some crazy stuff. Marty gets hit by a car and takes a little nap. Then he wakes up and he's like, Mom, is that you? Oh, was it all a dream? Was it all a dream? Oh, you're back in 1955. And he's like, oh my God. Looks up. His mom is way younger and she's looking at his underwear. She has taken off his pants, right? They don't know that they're related. Now I'm going to explain this, okay? I know, I know it's easy for us to just jump into like, oh, this is all taboo and weird and stuff. And I agree. It totally is. It's, it sends a small shiver up my spine too. However, if we look at these characters as not representing humans, but as representing cosmic entities or situations or atmospheric conditions, then you can understand a little bit more why this would be more acceptable and why these stories tend to repeat themselves over and over and over, like the ancient story of Oedipus, right? Anyways, she says, I've never seen purple underwear before, Calvin. 
Calvin, Calvin, why do you keep calling me Calvin? Well, remember Cal means the beam. It means a blue beam, right? Cal beam. Uh, and then Vin is related, I believe, to the word vine. So we have a vine and a um, and another vine. So there's two vines. Vin can also be beautiful. It's related to the word van or von. It can also mean Lord. Um, so he could be Lord of the vine, Lord of the beam, etc. Lord of the earth by extension. He says, oh, I guess they call you Cal. Now they purposefully say Cal instead of Calvin as a reference to that dog food earlier and the words and the root words that are implied. So uh, they're going down and the grandma makes another reference to his lifesaver, his uh, life preserver, whatever, the buoyant device that he's allegedly wearing symbolically. So he goes to Doc's house. There's Doc's garage over there in the corner. You can see it. Now you think that's his house, right? No, no, no. That's his house. That's where Doc actually lives in the past. Doc's family allegedly had a lot of money. They owned a lot of land. And this is Doc's house. He's well off. He's doing pretty good. That's, that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I loved, I'm so happy for Doc to, to have that. Anyways, he knocks on the door. Doc is working on some invention that allows him to express t telepathy. He allows him to read people's minds, right? Which is another post-apocalyptic post reference. And he's like, dude, I came here from 1985 I, in your time machine. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, who's the president in 1985, huh? You know, trying, kind of messing with them, but also a little bit curious, like, as to who the president would be. And he's like, Ronald Reagan... The actor? Remember, they showed you that purposefully to make a point that Ronald Reagan is an actor. So this concept of hiring people to lead you based on just popular consensus is about as ridiculous to them as this president in, um, damn, what was the name of that movie? Um, the, the political, uh, man, what is it called? Stupid. I can't remember the name. Somebody help me out in the chat. But anyways, you, you know what I'm talking about. Idiocracy. Thank you. Idiocracy, um, where this guy is the president, and they all love it. They all love the crap out of it because it's a show. It's a WWF. It's a drama. You know what I mean? Anyways, he takes him back to the time machine to prove it and to show him, and he's like, oh, my God, I drew the flux capacitor. Uh, he draws it kind of to the side there. Um, it actually is sort of tilted right there. It doesn't really matter because, you know, it still is what it is. 1.21 gigawatts of electricity is a bolt of lightning. They're talking about how to get them back. It's like, you need 1.21 gigawatts. Unfortunately, you never know when or where one is going to strike. Ah, but is that true? We're told that. People say that all the time, especially people on the weather, right? But we know where that beam of light is going to strike, where it's going to come from, right? Which is the North Pole. We figured out that portion of it. Now you just have to figure out the wind part of it and the wind comes in watching the, sh the signs and the symbols he's like we do now boom hands him a piece of paper this is a manuscript this is a writing or a scripture so in order to figure out when this happens and where this happens we have to read the writing the scripture we have to we have to read those writings from other times other than our own we have to step outside of our uh our norms of our time and we can figure these things out he says i can spend a week in 1955 no problem i'll hang out and he's like no marty that's out of the question. You must not leave this house. Why? He says, you must not see anybody or talk to anybody. Anything that you do could have serious repercussions on future events. Well, this sounds a lot like uh, one of the prime directives in Star Trek, right? For those people who are just traveling to new worlds, not for time travelers, so to speak. But to me, they're kind of one and the same. This is the prime directive. Don't interfere. Don't mess with the natural flow of how that world is going to grow. You know what I mean? Don't bring in your intellectual knowledge and advanced knowledge of, of, of technology and other things into this world. Allow them to grow naturally. That seems to be some sort of space rule from space cops. I don't know. Whoever made it up. Anyway, so he looks at the picture of his brother. He says, just as I thought. This proves my theory. Look at your brother. And the head is gone. His brother's head is gone. Erased from existence. Just like so many other things during this particular time that we live in, it seems that there are things that we were once used to being there that are no longer there or that have changed drastically in a way that we clearly remember them being. It's like they have been erased from existence. Do you remember the uh, cornucopia on the Fruit of the Loom? <laughs> I do. I clearly remember that, but it never 
was there. It's been erased from existence. That's called the Mandela effect. Interesting, and it directly ties into the, this concept of time travel or energetic flux in our world. All right, so he says, wait a minute, Doc, are you trying to tell me that my mother has the hots for me? Now, let's take a look at his mom and let's figure out why there's all this weird stuff happening in the family. The, the mother's name is Elaine. Elaine means shining light. The French girl's name, Elaine, means shining light. She, uh, let's see, in the King Arthur myths, Arthur is all about the adventures of the North Pole, the Blue Beam, etc. Um, in, in the Arthur legends, Elaine is a character who fell in love with Lancelot. Lance, Beam, Pole, etc., right? Um, Ot at the end is just plural. It's a Hebrew plural. It means many of them. So land of the beams, land of the pillars, etc. Uh, but Elaine means shining light. She represents Sophia. She represents the, the beam, as do some of the other characters in the movie, like Doc. Uh, it says pr precisely, whoa, this is heavy. This is heavy. He says, there's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Now, this is supposed to be like a side joke. I love it. I always laughed at this and thought it was funny. Ha, 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 ha. That's ridiculous because there isn't a problem with gravity. Duh. And it's just some joke that he made. No, it's actually dead serious. The further forward in time we go, the more pressure is added to the world and the heavier or the denser things become. When you increase the pressure, you increase the density. It says right here, density is directly proportional to pressure and indirectly proportional to temperature. As pressure increases the temperature constant with a, with a temperature constant density increases. And as your density increases, your weight increases. So things literally get heavier the further forward we go in time. All right. So he says, you've got to get your father and your mother to interact. Now we're talking about trying to make the father and the mother interact, which is to have a cosmic union. George is the father. Let's take a look at George's name. George comes from uh, many different words that imply throat or narrow passage. Sorry if I'm being kind of loud. I'm just, I got excited, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, a narrow passage, okay? So the narrow passage, it's a gorge, essentially. If you know what a gorge is, George is the same as gorge. It's from the Proto-Indo-European root word, guora, which means food, devouring, to swallow, etc. A deep and narrow valley. We have no, more valley symbolism, the hill valley. What am I saying? I'm saying that George represents the plasma volcano. Okay. He represents, uh, the thing that needs the light in order to make it useful. Essentially he's, he represents the gorge or the opening in the world. Symbolically the name does. And then Doc stops and says, wait a minute, there's a ceremonial, there's a rhythmic ceremonial ritual coming up. I just wanted to take a picture of that because I love that. I love that he doesn't say, oh, look, there's a school dance. He says, look, there's a rhythmic ceremonial ritual coming up, right? A rhythmic, that's what it is. Can we start doing that? I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start calling things what they really are instead of these lame labels and descriptions and names that we've forgotten about. Let's, let's go back to the old ways. I like that. All right, um, so check this out. This is really interesting. It says, according to Bob Gale, in one of the early drafts of the script, Marty's original last name was McDermott, not McFly. But they felt like McDermott was too much to say. It was a mouthful, right? So originally, they wanted him to be named McDermott, which defines him. What does McDermott mean? The name McDermott is derived from the Gaelic McDiarmada, or Diarmuid, which means free man. So Marty represents the free man, the one that's leaving the, 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 the restraints of this world, right? He's going to be free. He's a time traveler. He's a slider. He's a survivor of an apocalyptic event as he hid inside of the Faraday cage, which is the time machine. Anyways, it means free man or free guy, right? Which is why so many of these movies are about these types of uh, characters and they're represented by... Um, or in, by the blue color, etc. Even though Marty's actually represented by the red. It's just two different worlds. There's the twin, right? All right, so what are you writing? What are you writing? He's talking to his dad, and he's like, oh, science fiction stories about visitors coming down to Earth from other planets. He's like, what? The, I didn't know you wrote anything creative. Let me, let me see. He's like, no, 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 no. I never let anybody read my stories. This is another problem. This is showing our faults, Right? This guy holds our potential and it, we're, it's going to show us the potential that we have. But I recommend share 
You know what I mean? This is just fear. This is this is what peer pressure and fear in the world today does to those of us who have the spirit of the blue beam. The spirit of the blue beam is the spirit of goodness and purity and innocence, etc., which is everything that George represents. All right, anyways. He points over and he's like, I, I think Biff wants to take her anyway. And you see Biff over there, you know, trying to get with the girlfriend, his mom or whatever, right? Biff comes from the word beef. He's literally a meathead. He's a slice of meat. He represents the flesh. He represents just being, you know, base and fleshly. All he cares about is violence and sex and, uh, you know, cars, flash, all, all that worldly type of stuff. And then he says, hey, he, she said, get your meat hooks off. Meat hooks on Biff, right? He represents meat or flesh or fleshly things. So he says, why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? Make like a tree, the world tree, the tree of life and get out of here. That's where you go to get out of here. If you want to get out of this world, if you want to escape this world and, and leave the surface of the actual, stop living on the roof of the house and live inside of the house or outside of the house and go shopping for another house or whatever, symbolically, uh, you leave. This is the place where you leave is the tree. It's the exit place. He says, why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? So he's trying to convince George, like, dude, you got to ask out my mom. I need to be born. This is really important. And he's like, I'm not going to do it. And not you or anybody else on this planet. By the way, I think he's the best actor in this movie. Like this guy is the part is just, you would think that's him. Like that is just him. You know what I mean? The great acting. He says, nobody else on this planet's going to make me change my mind. I don't know if you could see it, but the rocks here actually form. There's an eyeball right there. That's kind of interesting. I, see that little eyeball? That's weird. Anyway, uh, so he needs to convince George, and uh, nobody on Earth is going to do it. George is wearing this T-shirt that, that's got these little inverted 33s on it or these little spiral-type things, um, probably symbolic of plasma. He's reading some fantastic stories, um, this represents those survivors of the apocalypse. George is going to be symbolically one of the survivors um, that make it through. Anyways, um, this is the mentality that we have. We're rebels. We're outcasts. We wear our rebel red. I mean, that's why I wear it sometimes. That's why the movies are representative. That's why there's so much red when I do this particular thing is because it, it suggests creativity. It suggests magic. It suggests danger. It suggests life, etc. All right. So he pops in some Van Halen. What does Van Halen even mean? Halen can also mean valley. Isn't that interesting? Another reference to a valley. Van Halen. Van means Lord or Vaughn actually means Lord. Van literally means like beautiful. So it's a beautiful valley, paradise, or it means the Lord of the valley. All right. So he puts it on his head. He's, he's doing the, the, um, he's doing the home alone type deal, which with the mouth open makes 101, right? 101, the tower, the tower and the inner earth entrance. That's where everything begins. That's where it starts. All right. So he's uh, acting like he's an alien, etc. We've been through that before. He says, uh, I, I've got to ask Lorraine out to the dance. Look at his finger, right? Why is he doing that? I don't know what that is. Um, he's like, Darth Vader came and told me he'd melt my brain if I don't take Lorraine out to the dance. He's like, ah, okay, okay, calm down. Maybe don't say that too loud. You know, Even though it's true, it did happen. Let's not say that too loud, right? It's a secret. There are some secrets that uh, the, the population cannot handle. The population will turn on you. They'll call you a witch. They'll burn you. I mean, we know this. We know this to be true. Anytime people go against the status quo, they turn into a bunch of freakish weirdos that all get together and gang up and try to hang people or burn them or whatever. It gets weird. So he's like, hey, whew, calm down. George walks in. George and Elaine, right? The light and the mountain. And he says, you are my density. Another reference. We talked about how everything's heavier in the future. Now he's talking about the word density and things being dense. And he says, my density has popped me to you. Pop, as in the, wor the world popping. Pressure like a grip, 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 and it won't let go. You know what I'm talking about from Encanto. Anyways, all right, so density, pressure, popping. There's all these references. He's wearing blue. And he says, I am your density. I mean, your destiny. They are destined to be together. All right, uh, let's see. So the bullies walk in. We get past that, we skip ahead, and we're in Doc's uh, garage. 
and Doc has the nail. Look at all this Vav symbolism, okay? As far as the blue beam in the middle of the world, right? The clock tower, etc. From the top of the clock tower down, we have the nail, which is a Vav, literally. We've got the clock, which is set to almost uh, like 5 after 10, it looks like, 4 after 10, which makes a V, another Vav right there. Uh, then we've got, let's see what else. Oh, we talked about this, other columns and stuff. And he says, from the top of the clock tower down, suspending it over the street between these two lamp posts. Posts. More post symbolism. There's the one and the one and the in the middle of those two posts. In the middle of those two pillars. So my butt hurts from sitting down. I'm sorry. I'll just be honest. Like, ah, I'm, I'm sitting on a pillow, but it's not helping. Anyways. <laughs> Too much information. I'm sorry. Anyways, um, there's the one and the one, and in the middle is the God. The two towers, and the in the middle is the Savior figure. In the middle is the beam of light, etc., or the two, the two God. Uh, so that's where Marty is aiming at. He's aiming between those two pillars. Those are the pillars of Hercules, also, uh, with this big pole and this hook. You you have to have a big pole. There's two smaller pillars off to the sides, which are the anode and the cathode. And they create an arc reaching up to create uh, to, to touch base with the central pillar, right? Which is a pole. And then this pole literally has a hook on it, the vav in the middle. There's, there, I mean, I, it couldn't be more blatant to me when looking at, at it through the eyes of the plasma apocalypse and alternative geography. Which runs directly into the flux capacitor. Now, a flux capacitor is something that stores energy, essentially, right? So if this is symbolic of the world that we live in, in the world... In the earth is where the energy would be stored. All right. So he takes this red car, thereby sending 1.21 gigawatts into the flux capacitor. Gigawatt, gigawatt, whatever. However, this, this car is not fully uh, all the way around metal. It's a convertible. So it catches fire because it's not an accurate Faraday cage, right? So Doc sees that. The car catches on fire. Probably takes a mental note. The car actually jumps off the table and hits this trash can, lighting it on fire. And we get the most iconic gasp in all of movie history. History. <gasps> I can't even do it. This cracks me up every time. Like I, my son watched this the other day for the first time, and when Doc goes, <gasps> like my boy laughed. <laughs> <coughs> Oh my God, he laughs so hard. It cracks me up. I love this character. All right, uh, so I, I took a picture of this. This is the movie theater. I'm like, where's the blue beam in the movie, right? Boom, here it is. Here's the blue beam at the church appropriately. Anyways, uh, we go to the enchantment of under the sea dance, and here you can see Trident, the Trident of uh, the God of the Ocean, etc. The Trident is figurative of the, the pillars in the land of the pillars, the light pillars, the sky beams, I should say. Now, he's inside of an awkward position there in the car with his mom, and she takes some alcohol, and he knows she's an alcoholic in the future. So he gives her a tip. He's like, eh, you shouldn't drink, you know? Also, you're going to give birth to me. I prefer you keep as healthy as possible, possible because it's going to benefit me, right? Um, we should take a good note. She, he's like, geez, you smoke too? Oh, my God, drinking and smoking? So this actually affects her. You'll see it in the movie later on. She doesn't seem to do those things and her life is so much better. This is inspirational to people like myself, knowing that I can change the future at any moment by my decisions I make now. All right, uh, let's see. We got about 20 more minutes to try to get through the rest of the movie. And he's like, the storm. The storm is the tempest, the plasma apocalypse. Marty's hand starts to disappear when you see fingers being cut off or hands disappearing, stuff like that. That represents the plasma that enters in from around our world that is cut off by the electromagnetic field that goes back up after the uh, polarity shift. Oh, and there's also like one eye symbolism as well, right? Finally, the two get together. George kisses the girlfriend. Everybody's happy. All, all the things go back to being normal or the way they should be, right? This world is not the way that it should be for people like myself. And those things come back. Now, did you notice this? In this picture, they show this picture quite a few times. They chose this particular backdrop. It's a well. All three of these, Marty's in the middle, dressed in all blue, right, symbolizing the blue beam, with two other people on either side, the two other columns, pillars, etc., symbolically, and they're standing, to give you more context, they're standing at a well. 
It's the wishing well. It's the well of the world. It is the opening. It's the tree trunk of the tree of life, etc. It's hold Mimi's holt. All right, so then he starts to rock out, right? He starts doing Johnny Be Good. Well, now that the world has changed, it's time to change our lives. It's time to be good is what I get from this, basically. Johnny is just your survivor of the apocalypse, your average Johnny or whatever, your John or Jane, uh, your Jack and your Jill that ran up the hill to fetch a pail of water from the well, etc. And now it's time to be good. It's time to change the world, right? Make the world a better place. Make the world what you would like it to be. Be good. All right. But then he takes it too far. He's not from a time when music is normal and stuff and, and enjoyable. He's from our time in which people are yelling and screaming and stuff. So at first he's rocking out. This is like me, right? Watching like, like 21 pilots or something, right? I'm listening to 21 Pilots and I'm rocking out and I'm like, this is such a good song. But then I get to the part where they start screaming and then this is me. And I'm like, oh, dude, why did you? Nah, you had it. You had, that's, that's totally me. I'm like, no, nah, I get it. I skipped the song at that point. I just, I like 21 Pilots, but I don't like it when they start screaming in their music. Anyways, uh, the instant the lightning strikes the tower. Why do they keep calling it a tower? It's obviously not a tower. It's just like the belfry of some building or whatever. That's not really a tower to me. But let's look at the word tower. Tower comes from tor. Tor means tower or by implication, a watch tower. Now, is it a tower where you stand and watch other things? Or is it a tower that you are watching for? That you're looking for a tower or a sign or a beam, etc., right? Uh, it comes from the Latin turis, a tower, a citadel, a high structure. Um, the clock tower is essentially the plasma volcano. Um, Tor. Tor means a hill or a rocky peak. Mount Maru or Rupus Negra is said to be a high and lofty peak. It is a mountain that juts almost straight up into the air. So he goes to the top of it and he's scared and he meets with this bluish white flash of light and he sees a panther or some sort of a statue guardian, right? It's the panther. Pan comes from meaning broad, shallow vessel, etc. Let me skip forward. So Pan, obviously there's the god Pan, right? The horned god, Kronos, etc. Uh, it also means, if we look down here from the Proto-Indo-European root word, Pet Anu, or Anu, or the word Pete. Pete is directly related to Pan, like Peter, Pan. It means to spread, to spread out, Pan, right? So Pan, and then ter, what does ter mean? Ter comes from the root word that means uh, animal. Pan means all or all encompassing or spread by implication, right? So all beast. A panther is the beast of Pan, the god Pan, the beast that comes out of the god Pan from above. So these are what I call phantazoids. They are giant animal creatures that are otherworldly, that come from other worlds, that float down in during the apocalypse. They are... This one was named the Panther. It's the, the beast of Pan, the god, Kronos, etc. Anyways, all right, so we see the clock. Boom. It's on 10 o'clock. Also, just an X. X marks the spot, the middle of the world, the plasma volcano. He says, you've got less than four minutes. There's the number four again for Marty McFly, who needs to fly. And he's representative of the, uh, the world itself. Then in the background, you see that they put this, Bluebird Motel. Bluebird. I've seen Bluebird symbolism throughout the movies as well. Specifically, this guy who says, Prot told me to find the Bluebird of Happiness, and it's from k -Pax, which also has the Blue Beam symbolism and some other things as well. Interesting. The Bluebird of Happiness. What is that from? It's from the Thunderbird. It's from the, the plasma discharge formation that comes from the Earth itself that spreads out and looks like the Phoenix or the Thunderbird or so many other interpretations, and it's always usually depicted as being blue. Uh, let me, let me, I'm going to zoom into this so you can actually read this with me. It is usually depicted with the color of its feathers as a lightning blue, the blue bird. Uh, this is actually the thunderbird in Native American le legends and myths. Lightning comes out, boom, hits the clock, or it's about to hit the clock tower. We got the Vav, steady on the way, on its, on its way to the middle in between those two poles, those two columns. Then we've got the clock tower, and the time comes. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I, I, I forgot how it goes. Anyways, I actually started singing Beetlejuice just now for some reason. Anyways, so the clock tower gets hit by lightning. Kapow! Plasma comes down from above, charges through. 
I just thought this part's epic. I just want to take a lot of pictures of it so we can see it. The lightning, the plasma comes down, hits it, etc. Boom, Doc Christopher Lloyd, who represents electricity in so many movies, right? He gets hit by the lightning, blah, 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 which basically probably gives him amnesia and uh, puts him into another stupor, I'm assuming, as Uncle Fester would agree with, also played by Christopher Lloyd, also gets electrocuted by lightning. Interesting. All right, so the DeLorean is coming through. Boom, hits, meets up with the lightning. It will go back in time. It will go through. It will start sliding into some other alternate Earth. I don't think this is time travel. I don't. I don't see a lot of... I don't know. That's just me. I don't want to de deviate from the movie too much because I love the concept. I love thinking about how time travel works or could work or whatever, but I'm not super convinced. I, I actually see alternative Earths and people are jumping to another Earth, another realm, and it's just like this one. So they just figure they're in the same place. It's just that they've traveled through time. You know what I mean? Um, anyways, I don't want to get too much of a tangent going off there. So there's light going off and then we look... Do I have it? Let's see. Let me, can I shrink this down? Let me see. There we go. So if you look here, you can see that there's the nine and then there's the one and the one or the two towers. So it's the tet. It also means emergency, stuff like that. There's also other situations that have happened that I can't really talk about, but you know what they are already. There's the blue beam in the middle. The nine is the tet. The 11 is the elven, the leaders, or those from the two towers or from the middle of the two towers, etc. The two columns, the two poles um, on either side of the mysterious island, which is the island that used to be there. Oh, check this out. So it does say Holt. You see that? So before it said Elmo, remember? Now it says Holt. Meaning like hold Mimi's Holt or the, the tree trunk of the world, right? Uh, what else? We've got the atomic kid playing in the background. That's kind of interesting. And then I thought this was interesting too. So this is in the future in 1985 when the clock tower is broken and Marty is about to arrive here. They have this helicopter flying around with this light. It kind of reminds me of like ball lightning just, just in how it looks. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's not what it's supposed to symbolize, but to me, I pick up on you know, the esoteric behind the esoteric. Anyways, we've got this, uh, this helicopter that's roaming about and it's like, it's supposed to be like, it's a police helicopter. You know what I mean? That's looking for trouble. Hill Valley's a ghetto. It's got these, all these homeless people sleeping, trash everywhere, graffiti with smeg mud nastiness written all over it. Like, yeah. Um, interesting side note, the California raisins paid to have the, their, their, their brand put in the movie. So they put it behind the bum who's sleeping on the thing. And the California raisins were like, we want a refund. <laughs> like, you know, don't put us in your movie. So they put them in the movie anyways, but didn't charge them. Anyways, uh, so Marty runs right into this building, the no damage to the time machine whatsoever, which is interesting. Uh, in the future, it's called Elmo's once again, and it's a church, the place that has the blue beam, right? Uh, so the bum guy wakes up. It says Elmo's rib. Can you see that? Let's zoom into that. It's not just Elmo, but it's Elmo's rib. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Kind of like where Adam was in the Garden of Eden and somebody took his rib from him, right? Lots of interesting connections going on. He goes back to the mall, which is now called the Lone Pine Mall. So the two towers became one tower, right? Uh, there's a symbolism there, and that is just all cosmic plasma discharges that we see and how the plasma is attracted to itself. So it ends up over time creating one tower instead of many. All right. So he goes back to the mall. JC Penny, by the way, do you remember it being spelled like that? That's another thing that has changed. Some people think that the, there's an extra E that was added. Uh, so Doc, nah, he, go, he runs up to Doc. He just saw him killed, right? And Doc was like facing the ground. So he flips him over. And this is how Doc flips over with his eyes like staring into the sky like he's like he's dead, not breathing or anything, right? I feel like Doc was messing with him. He knew this was going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, bro, he could have just rolled him over and he could have started. To, nah, he was pretending to be dead. I mean, that's just me personally. <laughs> he wakes up. He's probably been planning this out for many years, right? Because it turns out that he has a bulletproof vest. This is symbolic, I believe, of when we go into the post-apocalyptic world where everything has uh, an increased buoyant factor and weighs less. Those of us who have worked out and survived in this world have super... Uh, we're, we're more dense, essentially, than everyone who will be born into that world. We, our skin is tougher and more dense and stronger than those those things in the world to come. And they weigh less. So those bullets and stuff may actually just 
you know, bounce off of you, you know, depend on various factors, but that, that, that could be the reason for the, the bulletproof vest symbolism. Now, the reason that Doc was able to su- survive the apocalypse is because of an ancient scripture. At least this point in time, it's an old scripture. It's an old writing. Marty McFly did it. That doesn't mean it's any less important, right? So in order to survive, Doc has to read the scripture. He has to, Scripture just means script. It just means writing. It doesn't mean it's the Bible or anything, you know what I mean? But it's a writing. He has to read the, the writing. And then he says, well, I figured, what the hell, right? I love it. He's like, you know what? Screw it. Like, w- life is about taking chances. Life is about, that's what life is, right? Taking chances, living on the edge, you know? Anyways, so he jumps him into his car, drops off Marty at his house. He's like, I'm going into the future about 30 years. This time it's not pomp and glue. It's not, it's not pomp and show. He's not like Marty record this. He's like, F this man. I'm just going to go. I'm like, I'm not recording this. I'm not doing anything like the world's not ready. I'm just, but I'm personally going to go check it out. So he jumps into the DeLorean backs out. Marty takes a nap and wakes up at 10 27 in the morning, almost 10 28. Actually the clock's about to change. But for me, this is a personal Easter egg. Many of you out there might have your own personal Easter eggs. Some people call these angel numbers, numbers that you see all of the time, like they're meant for you. This one is mine. This was my platoon number when I was in the Marine Corps. This was my favorite radio station when I was growing up. This is the number on the clock that I see all of the time. Like this 1027 comes up all over the place for me. And one day I will figure out what the heck that means. (laughs) <laughs> all right. Anyway, so Marty looks in. His family's rich now. Uh, you can see that everything, they've got all this nice expensive stuff. They're dressed well. Everything's a lot better. His mom and dad are looking great. They're healthy. They're flirting with one another. This is this is like the golden age, okay? Symbolically speaking. Um, and they're showing them purposefully flirting with each other, right? When before they were more hesitant and there was more of this taboo to touch, you know, a a girl or a guy or whatever, but now they're openly showing you this flirtatious attitude because this is the golden age. And in the golden age, the energy is amplified. Your spirit is amplified. Your body is amplified. Everything is running on high, including, you know, the whole flirting factor. And that's why you have so much interactions between the gods and, you know, the humans and making babies and stuff. Anyways, so um, then you see Biff. Oh, I love this Biff. I wish this was the Biff. This is the this is the Biff I like. Like I I don't whatever, I don't care. He's more feminine and stuff, but I like it. And also, that world that we go into is going to be more feminine, okay? Or more effeminate. It's going to have that feminine energy instead of the masculine male energy that dominates today. So Biff is like um, I mean, I, I was just starting on the second coat, Mr. McFly. You know, he's totally n- not aggressive or anything. He, he's he brings in all the stuff. He's he's the slave now. Do you see that? And he's happy, right? Uh, we inherit the earth. And those people that were once the bullies all of a sudden don't have all those laws and, 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 and courthouses and cops and stuff to... Anyways, we inherit the earth. We become the masters. And the masters become the slaves, right? Because they are afraid that we're going to take control, right? Well, I mean, what do you do when your slaves take control, right? So he becomes very happy as well he should, right? He's put in his place. All right, so he's like, oh, Marty, I, your, your new book is here, uh, Mr. McFly. Oh, hi, Marty. Hi, hi. He's, he's, so, he's so just outgoing and just happy and stuff. He's so excited to open up the box. Look at him, right? I just love this. He's, he's put in check. That's not just Biff. It's the whole rest of this world, right? You ever wish you could just, you know, change people in the world because the world's messed up? This is what it would be like. Biff's like, oh, open it up. He's so excited to look at it. And then he's got his first book. This is where I think I'll make a shout out to my first book called Ancient Oblivion, The Plasma Apocalypse. I've talked about and referenced The Plasma Apocalypse all throughout my channel. I have a website devoted to it called jdreamers.com. And um, yeah, my first novel. I'm pretty proud of it. So feel free to check it out. You can actually read uh, many of the first pages for free and see if you like it too. It's on Amazon, and there's a link to it in the, des- in the description. He says, you can accomplish anything. Oh, Marty, here's your keys. Ah, ah, here's your keys. He's so excited. He's like a little puppy. <laughs> um, he's like, here's your keys. So now Marty becomes the key master, inheriting the keys, getting his four by four with the fours associated. And then his girlfriend shows up, and she's like, how about a ride, mister? And he goes, oh, Jennifer, oh, my God. And he's, she's like, Marty, you're acting like you haven't seen me in a week. 
Well, that has been a week. It's the week of the apocalypse. The apocalypse lasts for about a week. It's hell week, right? And uh, she's like, yeah, you're acting like you haven't seen me in a week. And he's like, he's soaking her in. And uh, my heart breaks because they, they replaced this Jennifer in part two with some other Jennifer, the chick from like cocktail. It was not a good fit for me. To me, this was Jennifer. I liked this Jennifer. That's, that's, you know, I don't know. I'm anyways. So I, I, I can relate that Marty's like, Oh my God, you know, because in the next movie, it's going <laughs> to, it's not the same Jennifer at all. And I don't like it anyways. So doc shows up, boom, he's got futuristic stuff going on. He's like, what are you doing doc? And he's like, I need fuel. And they show you Mr. Fusion. Doc goes through and gets the trash to put into this fusion generator, which in the future, it's implied, everybody has one of these. They don't need gas and stuff like that. They just use clean, natural, home energy reactors called fusions or fusions, fusion generators um, from Mr. Fusion. I want to give a huge shout out. I don't give a lot of shout outs on my channel, but uh, David LaPointe or David LaPointe uh, channel on YouTube. This guy has done the primer field videos that I've shown you many times that show you how the Taurus field works and stuff. And I have related that, not that he has, um, but I have related that to alternative geography and cosmology of our local world. This guy, David LaPointe, has created a fusion generator, a fusion engine, essentially, that you could make in your own home. So if you get the chance to definitely go check out his channel. Um, because it's, it's huge, right? Um, it's, it's pretty huge. It's free energy essentially, or low cost, extremely low cost energy that will last a very long time. And it's very clean as well. So this one's called primer fusion part one. Definitely recommend it's got 11,725. I hope to see that number increase because this is huge. He also has an entire website where this this is not patented. I mean, this is not, not patented. This is not something that you are not allowed to make. He actually encourages you. He tells you, he gives you the schematics and stuff on his website and says, here, you know, you want to make this, go make it right. Anyways, it's very, very cool. I like to see stuff, people doing stuff like that. So there's the Mr. Fusion. He's like, doc, we don't have any roads to get up to 30, uh, 88 or whatever. He's like roads where we're going. We don't need roads. Pa pow puts on the glasses. Uh, let's see what else. So they show the time machine. It backs up and it's coming right at us. The blue beam and everything. Pa -pow, and that is it. This is actually the beginning. It's by Universal. Do you see this interesting like circles going on out, out there outside of the world or whatever? That's supposed to be... I mean, it's the DC symbolism. It's the two worlds colliding, colliding as well. But this is supposed to be like the Van Allen belts, which is literally the sky, the firmament or whatever. Anyway, that's back to the future. I had a blast. I can't believe I did all that in time. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost time for me actually to go pick up my son. I am a proud father, um, single dad, and I do all of this from home. I like, I like to do things so that you guys can get to know me a little bit. Um, but man, I love doing this and I hope that I can do this, um, much longer. And, uh, if you want to support my work by becoming a member or joining my website or buying my book or even just sending a donation, um, it's super appreciated and it, it helps me to be able to do stuff like this more often. Um, I, I only say that because I don't like to talk about money, but, um, I might have to actually stop doing YouTube. I'm kind of like, I don't know, iffy. I'm doing something wrong, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, I don't want to get too off topic. It was a great presentation. Um, I'm going to figure out my stuff. So I want to do this. I want to do this a long time. You know, I like doing this. This is fun for me. Um, so let's cross our fingers. Okay. Hopefully J journals will be around for a long time. Check out the website, check out the book. And, uh, I had a great time. This was a great movie. I might do a round two in around three. I don't know. I don't know. I'm contemplating. But if you guys have some movie recommendations, please let me know. I actually get a lot of them from you. One person, the last person who res recommended a movie was like, Jace, uh, Jdreamers, can you break down everything everywhere all at once? And I had no idea that was the name of a movie. So I'm like, yeah, I do that all the time. Like, you know, we're all one. We're all connected, etc. <laughs> then I saw that there's a movie called that. So I might do that one next. I don't know. Anyways, I love you guys. I got to go pick up my son and be a dad for the weekend. I'm going to have a blast. Have a good time. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and anything that you put your mind to can, you can achieve. I think that's probably one of the best points of this movie. You have the power to change the future. There is never a time that you are not actively affecting the future as an entire whole.
right? Anyways, until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer. <laughs> until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, for me.